I want to post more this a minute, and if we keep playing after this, so be it. But um. This game is a flawed gem, really enjoyed large swaths of it, really disliked large swaths of it. It's kind of weird. It starts kind of boringly slow. I know it's a tutorial and they're trying to walk you through the system, but it's really uninteresting. It's much more interesting once you get out into this area and start exploring. I kind of like the uh, an unknown map that you're kind of adventuring in, but they, had to, they have to have done a better job um, of setting up these zones better, right? Um, we just really need, in a world this open, you can't be walking into things way above you or way below you. You need some sense of where to go. And normally this would be like GM guidance. And we don't have that here. And what it ends up being is just a time sink, right? A waste of your time for no reason. You end up walking into a zone that you can't fight and you leave. You end up walking into a zone that's super tedious and you just face roll it. Um, I liked... I like the dungeon and the map system. Like it's kind of neat to have like kind of a themed map. You said to, you head to a map, there's stuff on it. I like the way the perception unlocks stuff. I hope not much content is gated behind it. Like I don't mind missing out on loot. Although I hope you're not missing out on interesting quest interactions. I love the character building. Um, I wish it was a little bit easier. I really think that you're, 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 instead of having player companions show up and also have stories, Probably what should happen is the story should be assigned to one of your companions is probably what it should be and that should just be how they do that if they because i think the interactions from that are fine but you kind of need them with your party this is it's a clunky thing switching to and from these characters who you don't bring along with you and don't really care about um let's see the game has been fairly not buggy as a whole there's definitely some small bugs in there sometimes the spell interactions etc i don't know that that has to be perfect you want it pretty close because you're porting in a, a known system you want the system to behave identically on the PC as it does uh, in your regular games. So sometimes those bugs were annoying, things like um, stacking bonuses that shouldn't be there or spells behaving differently than they do in the base game. You know, you can make some decisions about that as a developer if you're deliberately rebalancing, but there are, I'm almost certain those things that we encountered were bugs. Um, I like the idea of the expansion of our territory and I really didn't think I was going to. I was thinking, you know, this was gonna be a combat uh, RPG. We're gonna be wandering around taking these cool fights and that's gonna be the game. And they're, they're adding this other layer of like counselors and kingdom management. And I actually found it kind of enjoyable once we started with that, but the interface for it is abysmal. It's, you as the player are often left frustrated or I as the player, I'm often left frustrated with how that interface works as opposed to actually enjoying the experience of managing my cities even though i like the idea in theory of managing my cities having artisans expanding my territory dealing with the diplomacy around it it just isn't done well so that needs to be addressed and i'm sure that i'm sure the sequel i mean a lot of the shit i'm sure is going to be addressed in the sequel um what else combat as a whole is pretty good but the, the, we needed a buff manager like if if this game is going to be this devoted to buffing which it really is, we need a buff manager is the first thing. It just has to be there. Like I, I'm manually casting something in the vicinity of what, like, I mean, like seven buffs on this guy, like five on this guy. You know, I'm probably manually casting on average five to 10 buffs per character. Say low kind five. So I'm, I'm manually casting 30 buffs and I cast buffs every few minutes of gameplay. Like that's crazy. That's so much useless work that you're doing as the player that can be done by a computer. That's what computers do well. They do that kind of shit really well. There's no reason that I need to be doing that as a player. Um, what else? Uh, the fight pacing I'm not entirely certain about. I didn't feel pressured by fight pacing, so I could rest every two buff cycles. That's it, kind of neutral. If the if the management of the of the empire puts enough time pressure on you that resting is a resource and that's communicated to the player, that makes it a bit more reasonable. But really, there's nothing ever stopping me from just taking another rest and then having full resources to move forward. There were some of the most fun fights we had when, when we was when we didn't do that. But that was a kind of me just pushing forward to see what we could do, kind of do, see how it felt. And occasionally you'd run into content that just deletes you if you aren't full buffed. Which brings me to my probably biggest complaint of this game is that it is a combat RPG in large part. There's a lot of combats in here. The turn-based mode is a massive improvement over the real time in my opinion, but the combat doesn't scale. The difficulty doesn't scale well. And it's it's made worse by the fact that you don't know the difficulty of areas going into it. You can't like try to match your level to something like equal or slightly higher. The pacing of the axe, uh, 
cause problems with that too. Surprise rounds cause problems with that. Uh, the interaction of any sort of storyline event with your party causes problems with that. You start in weird positions. You start with random surprise rounds you shouldn't have in your favor. Um, things like that are all pretty, pretty toxic for this. And I hate the difficulty scaling because once you get into it a little bit, it's a pretty complicated system. You build some characters that are maybe like a little bit better than like the base characters you might start with kind of deal, or maybe just a little bit better than the average character you start with. And then you start fighting through it and you're like, this is fun. I wish these enemies scaled up in a meaningful way, but they don't. They scale up in ways of like, just like stat bags. So like all your things don't do things. So rather like you're a powerful wizard, but none of your spells ever fucking hit anything. Okay, well now you have to get synergetic stacking debuffs to do that. Okay, which I've done that. And now I have powerful synergetic stacking buffs and now nothing can stand up against me. I, I don't like the surprise mechanics for like a, a number of their encounters where this kind of like, if you know what's coming, you pre-buff like electricity resist. And if you don't know what's coming, you open the well, three of these heads pop out. They double round lightning bolt you each going twice in a row and they kill your whole party from full to zero. And you go, oh, well, I guess I'll load and do it again. That's not beneficial to the player. I don't, I don't care about the difficulty of it, but I care about how that difficulty is presented there, right? Which is... I mean, I do care about the difficulty. I'm saying that's not too hard. It's just stupid the way you do that. I shouldn't be taxed either the knowledge that I had ahead of time or the load. Both of those are dumb, right? Like it's just, it's just not a good mechanic for that. Um, I, I like the custom, customiz, uh, customization of the options. Things were like that were pretty damn good. I like that I could turn on death door. Death door was a nice compromise between getting one shot by enemies that killed my character outright, but not having to end the game when that happened. It, uh, it was kind of a penalty once we turned on time a little bit and that I had to travel to uh, one of a few locations to rest out of that. That was pretty damn good. Um, yeah, the game did love doing that and love doing that repeatedly. I don't think I should be returning to locations very often either. So like uh, one of those earlier maps, I think it's Old Sycamore, has, like, has encounters at like four different levels. But I don't have a lot of reason to return to Old Sycamore. So like having those other encounters is just kind of annoying. I kind of have to mentally do that. Which brings me to my next point. Why can I not write notes on this fucking map? Like, there's no reason that shouldn't be allowed. I should just be able to add a note, be like, giant undead wisp there, need to come back at 13 or something. So if I, they are gonna, if, in, in, if they are wanting me to utilize these locations multiple times because of different levels of content, I should at least be able to track that in a way that lets me keep track of that internally, that so I know when to go back and don't forget about it or lose out on that content. There's a ton of a ton of item diversity, a ton of scrolls diversity, a ton of build diversity, a ton of weapons. The crafting system is pretty damn cool. I like the collecting different pieces that you find small pieces over time at different maps and then you put them together to make something. That's I thought that was fun. I, th I thought it was like a kind of you feel like you're you find a piece you're like, ooh, I wonder what that will be, which is kind of a nice feeling in an RPG. You know, our character selection made it a little bit awkward for in terms of utilizing gear, but that's a that's a problem of the system, not so much a problem of the game. Maybe they could have done stuff to address that, but I wouldn't really hold them accountable for that. The fact that all your best tanks don't wear armor is kind of annoying, but that's a function of the game, that, or a function of the of the of the the game that's ported in to make this game, right? The Pathfinder system, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, what else? What do you think I've missed here? Oh, the town stats just seem needlessly complicated for what they're doing. Their impact seems rather minimal, quite honestly. I appreciate that they had an auto uh, run kingdom option. And I think that's really cool. I think that's a really great idea, but the auto kingdom needs to be comparable in its outcomes if you're gonna auto run it. The point of turning off the kingdom isn't to not have any of the benefits or downsides of having a kingdom. The, the, but the, the point of turning on the auto manager is you want these things to happen, but you don't wanna manage them yourself. So you need them to be at least somewhat competent in that and Maybe this requires we invest in BP so the, the uh, advisors can do it. Or I don't, I don't know what it requires, but it's got to have something better going on behind the scenes for it. Because this territory expansion and city management is part of what this game is about. And if you don't have it, it kind of loses the appeal, right? It's, it's, it's all good and well. Like I looked at that and thought to myself, that's not something I want to do in this game. I'm going to turn it off. And then we were running into all sorts of problems with the progression of the game. When you don't have companions because you chose mercenaries, which is an option, and then you also turned off city building because you didn't want to do that and that's an option you expect those options to not destroy your portion of your your ability to enjoy the game and they kind of were to some degree we're sitting around like scratching our head why do we have 375 days here what's the point of this why wouldn't we rest at every encounter what's the point of this you know maybe another again another solution maybe if they're going to build so many companion driven quests you know maybe the companions just come out and your mercenaries become those companions right we've already kind of mentioned this that seems reasonable kind of deal um 
what else? Oh, the alignment system. Again, that may be a function of the, uh, of the game system itself as opposed to the game port. The alignment system is kind of garbage. I, I, they, the, what the game is telling me is neutral good or chaotic evil doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense as to how those actions are. And because this is limited to like option one, two, three, four, when you interact with the character, well, that means that you're kind of forced into an alignment system that doesn't make any sense and you can't like, can't work with the DM to add nuance or flesh out details or understand why that perspective is that thing. You're just kind of stuck pressing one of those buttons. And often that means I'm just picking the best option or sometimes trying to be coherent but having really dumb outcomes from that kind of stuff. And that's kind of pissing me off. Yeah, respecting the companions may be reasonable. You know, they could just do away with this if the companions but in the base game, you just don't have mercs. And the companions in the base game are just fully are fully blank slates. So they have their storyline programmed into them. You just, they're any race, any class kind of deal. And maybe that doesn't work for someone like Knock Knock who's supposed to be a goblin over there. Maybe you have to finesse that a little bit in some way. But the solution they went with, although coherent for the storyline, doesn't really do a lot for the player in terms of making this, this experience a seamless experience, right? So, um... Yeah, alignment is objective and subjective, and maybe I'm just not understanding it cleanly, perhaps. That's certainly a possibility. What else, chat? Anything else you guys could think of that I have um, mentioned explicitly liking or disliking? I kind of wanted to give them a fairly, I wanted to give a fairly uh, balanced review of the game, because I think this game is really fun in parts and really boring in other parts. And it's so long. So long is both, I mean, that's another really interesting balanced thing, right? Like. Long games are often good. More of the content that's great is really fun. But also there's so much of a time investment. Torches, um, the early game combats were on a higher difficulty were really, really binary. You either had the answer to that encounter or you didn't. So you either had 12 stacking accuracy buffs to begin with or you didn't hit him. Uh, you either had your torch counter at level one when all your characters are super undeveloped and don't have a lot of options or you don't, your swarm counter. And again, I think that's bad. I think that's mostly bad character design. Like we, the quest was like, here's some alchemical, fi alchemical fires that you can bring because there's nasty spiders. So I bring the fires. I burn through those fires in like the first swarm and it's not dead. And that leaves me like five more swarms to deal with without a way to deal with them. Pretty dumb. Enemy AI is bad. I, I don't necessarily, enemy AI doesn't necessarily have to be good here. The way, there's, there's ways around that, right? Like I don't need the AI to be the smartest thing ever but we gotta have enemies that are still challenging to the player. So you can, there's, there's, just, there's other systems for making challenge to the player that don't necessarily involve a smart smart enemy computer, right? It doesn't have to be reacting well to you. You can do things like add more, give them pretty pretty um, strong telegraphed abilities, whatever else you want to do. There's, there's tons of options for that, right? So not necessarily, more stats is kind of that, but the method they chose for this game doesn't really fit the system super well in terms of keeping the encounters interesting. I think it's important to consider the game is designed for real-time and not turn-based, but only partially. The game is better in turn-based than it is in real-time, in my opinion, and it might have been designed for uh, real-time, but they did add a turn-based option. And if they're adding this as a as a play an intended playable option, intended playable option needs to be playable. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Sorry, um, NQT. Um, again, like a really good game that has a lot of content isn't necessarily a bad thing. Right? Like, I'm not sitting here, like, when I have a game that's so fucking sweet, I never want to stop playing it, and it's a single-player story-driven game, having a longer single-player story is often really nice. And the thing is, we're playing a game that has character progression, right? This is a system that is based around going 0 to 20. So maybe you could cut some portions of this, but it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing independently. The problem is the fights at this point are grindy and boring, not fun and engaging. Yeah, I understand that the base game was designed around that, but when you're making additions to your game, like if you just tack on a feature that doesn't work, you can't really be like, you can't be upset when players are like, hey, your feature isn't really working. They're like, well, the base game wasn't designed with that feature. I know, but you added it as a feature. You have to do the the base, the, the work to balance that. So, I don't know, flawed gem. Um, I'm really looking forward to at least playing through a little bit of the um, the next game when it comes out. I'm just scared of when to approach it, right? Like this game has been out for two years or something. And when I first played it, it was a buggy mess. I played it here. It's totally playable and quite good in parts, although too much for me of the things we've already just talked about. 
but I'm, I'm I don't know when to approach the sequ the sequel, right? Like, do I dive in right away because it's cool and new and it's something fun to play and then run into the fact that it's not well done and it's a story driven game. So the next time I play, I'll know all this information prior to it and spoil it for myself or or rather detract from some of the things I might end up doing. You know? So I don't I don't, I don't quite know. I, I I've enjoyed this game a lot. Talk about this game as it compares to Pillars. Um, I don't remember what the pillars creation process was like. I remember them having like all unique characters and classes and it being pretty damn good and pretty fun. I liked pillars uh, stuff. Pillars had a similar problem though. Pillars released as a uh, real time fighting game. And then it gave you like half the tools you needed, maybe like nine tenths the tools you needed. The AI scripts weren't quite a good enough to automate it fully and it's difficulty scaling wasn't super great. The same problems I'm having here, right? Which I think I think you got to do one of two things. You either need to build a a real time system where the player spends their time ahead of time pre programming how they want their characters to act, and then takes control only in exceptional circumstances. In which case, the fights are fairly quick. You add things, but but you need the player needs full control to do that. Then you need you need your ability to set those macros up to do as you want their character to do, and that's a fairly complicated tool building set, right? And Pillars gave you a lot of that, but wasn't quite there. Or you need to build a turn-based system, let the player do it all. But if you do the turn-based system, you got to be aware of the time commitment for doing these things. This is supposed to make D&D &D combat rounds faster. And it does, but there's still so much, man. After one round of patches, possibly. Next game uses the same engine. Um, you say a lot of the bugs have been worked out, Nick, but I'm, I'm actually a little bit more concerned now that you say that than I was a second ago. Because... I'm seeing like surprise round, surprise in this game is done. Oh, you know, that's another positive thing about this game. I really like how they did uh, the skill interactions by and large. It's still a little bit annoying that like your main character, like this, it's a little bit buggy the way they implemented it. You lose your skill selection when you have your main character, which is super annoying for all the, uh, the times in this game where you only have your main character. But again, that's a function of the companion swapping shit more than it is a function of uh, of that, of, of their, of, um, the design of that so you could either a make it so your companions are always around for this shit or b you could just not give skill checks that are required when your companions uh when your guys alone but i like the skill system i felt like skills and camping to a large part camping to a minor part i felt like the skills were relevant right like having skill coverage in my team made for a smoother advancement i really liked stealth was not done well of the skills in here that kind of uh, i felt like got punished the most i think um stealth Real bad. Trickery guy, the EK or um, Arcane Trickster rather kind of trivialized trickery, although I appreciated trickery. I thought perception was done extremely well. And the mobility, athletics, and um, other checks like that were kind of okay. And then I thought uh, Arcana was, I thought these were really fun. This is the first time I think in a DD &D game in a very long time that I've enjoyed lore roles. And I liked lore ro roles here. Because the lore roles let me solve puzzles a little bit, right? So like I'm encountering enemies. It's the first time I've seen this enemy. I don't know how this enemy is going to behave. My lore role information would give me some of their stats and I could formulate a plan based on their stats. Now, it turns out there wasn't a lot of depth to that. It's basically like, do I want to attack them with reflex? It's basically, I mean, it was a little bit. It was stuff like, which AC do I want to target if I can target an AC? Touch. Do I want to try to make them flat-footed? Do I want to go after the regular AC? Do I want to use abilities that make me do more damage at lower accuracy or not? And then also, what type of attacks are they likely to do? I wish almost like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how it would be. Like maybe like, maybe you you step into an encounter and you, all your buffs are automatically off or something, and like you roll your lore and then you get like a buff sequence. Or I don't I don't know what, what exactly what it'd be. I'm, I'm just spitballing as we think about this. But I liked that. I got information about my enemies as I fought them and that I could react to that information. And this, that's a really cool implementation of lore, which the lore skills, which are often considered kind of like whatever skills, right? So I liked seeing those. I liked the way they did um, perception. The idea that you, with more perception coverage, you get more stuff, but not necessarily stuff that detracts from the storyline. Although I'm a little concerned that some of the crafted items, you might not have been able to find the parts because you failed the stealth rolls, but anyways. All right. The illustrated images were kind of neat too, like the series of skill checks, I agree. All right, other thoughts, questions about this game? Uh, 
maybe one more. I'll give you one more chat. So this a new subscriber arrives. Hey Colster, thank you for the, the sub. It fills you with determination. This page was awesome and frustrating at the same time. There's so much information conveyed on these pages, especially when you're multi-classing, and it's really good, but it's just not it's not a hundred percent. It's like ninety-five percent. Like combining multi-classes with um, things like bloodline specialties, it doesn't really accurately represent what's happening to the player on this, or not in a way that's parsable by anyone who's... Not, not, not in a way that's an easily accessible information source a lot of the time, right? So with a single class, really simple. Really nice things like your feats are replaced by the icon of the feat you took. That's super cool, so you can easily look back on where, when you got things and what the impact was. In general, it's super well, it's super well done, but it fell apart a little bit with the multi-classing. Um, oh, summoning animal companion is probably too strong, but that's probably a that's probably a function of the base game. It's all. It, it, I mean, the bad AI makes it is worse when with something like summons, because summons are disposable, um, disposable creatures. You just toss in front of them, the AI hits them, the AI wastes its turn, you move past, kind of deal. But to a lesser degree, so are tanks. There aren't tanks in D D mostly, so. The ability to run like two high AC characters and nobody and nobody else have any AC isn't really how D&D tend to work out either for me. Yeah, so I don't... Oh, they changed them from pen and paper and they're stronger? Well, maybe that makes it worse, right? You know, like the, the way that they've implemented the system. Again, they, they, I don't begrudge them making balance changes to the D&D system. I just want a good game at the end of that. Other thoughts about this. And, you know, Animal Companions are supposed to have permadeath. Are they really? So I'd have to like resurrect the cat if it got killed. I'm glad I, I'm glad I artificially limited it to one. If I had had more than one, I would have been super pissed. Yeah, some of this is certainly that D&D has its own flaws. I agree 100%, Ikridon. Would I be willing to try this with mods to fix it? No, I don't think I'm diving into this game. The problem with this game and mods is that this game is so long and so deep that modding, modding it and then playing it from there is going to be pretty damn large a time investment. And I'm very suspicious of mods in general because most of the time I don't think they're the goals of the modders align with my with my goals, right? My goals are pretty simple. My goals are uh, have a challenging, engaging game at as many levels as possible. And I, I often think mods are sometimes about adding cool new content or uh, making the game easier for sticking points. Like, that's why I like quality of life mods, but not overhaul mods generally, because I, I'm not always convinced of the modder's ability to do that. And there might be some great mods out for that, footer, but like, I don't understand. I, I can't evaluate what they're fixing without having played the game and seen the flaws. And by the time we fix it, I'm not even convinced that that's necessarily going to be a fix. So I don't, I don't want to dive into it again. It's just such a big inve like, time investment. And I thought we had, you know, reasonable viewership for, for an RPG on my channel, which kind of do so-so. But this is so fucking long. We're on act like we're like early act three and there's what eight acts yeah oblivion um i think i think there's a subset of my viewers yourself probably included that did enjoy this a lot and i enjoyed this a lot so i stuck with it as long as i did better to play better than mods yeah i agree six or seven seven or eight yeah yeah and i i think you know my, my take home from this is i'd really like to try the sequel i'm really hoping they nail it with the sequel because this is so close this is again a flawed gem this has so many good things so um I am really looking forward to a sequel of a similar vein. This is the best CRPG I've played in probably years. I'm trying to think. I liked it better and I liked Pillars, but I like turn-based a lot better. This is kind of what we do on this channel, right? So we try a bunch of different games and we try to play the fun ones for as much as we can content we can get out of it. And then we move on to check out other fun games as they show up until we find something that's so damn good we can't do anything else for it. <laughs>